Dow Meeting Archives, January 24, 2016. China Fall 2015 by Ed Monahan. Okay, everyone, let's go ahead and do the, the meeting beginning ritual TV. Mian Shang Otang, Tanja Sanjigong, Yi Jigong, Zai Jigong, San Jigong, Tanja. 参加各位顶传师，一鞠躬，开班，一鞠躬，请坐下。Please be seated. Hello, everyone. How you doing? I have the good fortune of actually being at the temple with Derek today, so uh, I'm excited about that. I haven't been able to make it out. I made it out a few weeks ago, but um, I'm hoping to do that more regularly now because I miss it in my own uh, practice. And um, Bill, completely apropos your topic, <laughs> because my wife and I were not harmonious uh, this morning as I was uh, leaving, so that gives me lots of good, um, lots of good feedback to be able to apply uh, when I make my way back. Although I do have to say, <clears throat> uh, the vast, vast majority of the time uh, we are in a very good place with one another, and it is because we practice uh, these teachings, and uh, I'm very grateful for that, and grateful for the openness on both of our parts to be able to uh, to practice as such. So as uh, Derek mentioned, he asked me quite some time ago if I would share about our uh, trip to China that we took in October, and uh, I am very happy to do so. Um, I have tried to summarize, this was two and a half weeks worth of travel, and I tried to summarize this and place multiple photos on the, uh, on the slides to kind of uh, expedite the process a little bit because I didn't want to turn this into a 500 picture expose. So um, I, uh, hopefully that will work out. So it, it may be a little bit dark, but hopefully you guys can see it on your uh, computers. We uh, left the 10th of October from LAX, and there's Joanna and I getting ready to hit the road. And <clears throat> we arrived in Beijing the same day. It was a time warp. How does that happen? So um, obviously going back, uh, the time difference allowed us to arrive on the same day. It was a quite long flight and uh, but uneventful. Hours, right? Yes. Uneventful. We went to Air China and that worked out perfectly well. Everybody was very friendly. And uh, that is the delegation as we arrived at the uh, at the airport. Uh, Master Joe had us unravel the Wudong uh, US Wudong Association banner at pretty much everywhere we went to take a nice group photo. So that was kind of fun to be able to do that. Now what I'm I, what I did not put on here uh, that I thought was uh, really kind of funny, and I, I'm sorry, I didn't, but I should have. Uh, there, was a, there was a restaurant, fast food place, inside the uh, airport, and I saw it in several other places in China that had, I, I don't know what it said because I didn't ask anybody, but it was completely a... a uh, uh, caricature of Bruce Lee that was some kind of fried chicken place or something. <laughs> I don't know what it was, but I thought that was funny because that was the first thing that I saw was Bruce Lee when I yeah, got off the plane and went into the airport. Our, um, our trip consisted of, let's see if I can, you know what, actually the slide on here is not matching the slide that's up. Do I just Click on the sidebar. Um, yeah, you can uh, you can just um, okay. click on this one and then click on the there yeah. There you go. It, but it bumped me up a few. Oh, well, that's all right. Here we go. Let's and see. By the way, the Colonel Sanders fried chicken is the southern style fried chicken, not as powerful as the uh, Bruce Lee northern style. Oh well, there you go. <laughs> Okay, so now I am there. 
weird things happen. Oh, um, so get hit by clicking on the sidebar here, did I sort of throw myself off? Because uh, I'm no longer able to move it on. The oh, um, let's see. Just uh, I think we just have to put, put, put uh, click the mouse there, and then and then we should be able to maneuver. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm just going to verbally do this. I'm sort of move the cursor around. Uh, I, I'd be oh, happy, there it is. I got it. I'd be happy to. Thank you. Uh, Derek's helping me to negotiate the pathways of his PC. I'm used to working on a Mac, but that's probably me just being inept in general on computers, but uh, you guys will get the idea. So what we did was we flew in here to Beijing, and then we made our way immediately to Wuhan, uh, where was the first stops. Then we went to Wudong. Then we went back to Beijing. Whoa, we did it again. Hold on, where'd I go here? Was that by plane or by train? It was by plane. We okay. flew all of, the, all, all of the above. And then we went to Shanghai after that. So uh, it was quite a journey and as large as China is, I uh, now have my appetite wet to be able to go back and go to Taiwan, explore more of the vast country because it was uh, very enjoyable. The first stop that we had was Wuhan, and uh, I'm, I'm kind of hitting the highlights of it, otherwise we'd be here all day, so I'm just going to do the bits and pieces. We. Um, Wuhan University is the largest university uh, in Wuhan, which is a rather large city. And we were able to participate in a cultural exchange on the Dao, uh, which was very interesting. There were Taoist masters, Tai Chi Chuan masters who performed demonstrations, uh, a Taoist priest who gave a talk, that, and they were very kind in that they translated everything. Uh, Master Joe is on the left, uh, and this was again to uh, essentially compare and contrast activities as they occurred with regard to the Tao and Taoist practice in the U.S. and, uh, of course, in, in China. Uh, it was a relatively large audience. That's just about an eighth of the room that I captured that uh, shot on the top there. and. Uh, Master Joe asked me to uh, give a talk on my experience in uh, with the Tao and how it applied in the context of studying with him. Uh, there were wonderful demonstrations given by a uh, a lady who practiced, uh, and I, and I was never really clear on what it was. They set her up on the side of the stage while the other men talked. And she was creating calligraphy of uh, Taoist symbols uh, through the use of, I'm not even, I think it was sand that she was creating it in. And uh, they were very pretty. I did, I do have to comment that I noted, noticed a stark contrast in the way in which the men were treated as compared to the uh, to the lady, uh, where they they were very interested in everything that the men had to say, including me, and not particularly interested in, in the lady, even though they did invite her up on stage. They sort of brushed her off when uh, Master Joe was asked to give a demonstration. And, and I do have to say that Master Joe, when he after he gave a demonstration, he was mobbed. I mean, it was like. He was a rock star over there. It was uh, very interesting to see how he was treated there as compared to how he's perceived here. He's treated with great respect here, but boy, he was, it was really, uh, uh, really apparent. Um, after, um, after Wilhelm University, where we were actually uh, by one of the PhDs there who arranged the forum, he took us and um, showed us his research work, and interestingly, it was a, 
a derivative of Chinese language, that was an, an ancient derivative that was created by women, for women. Uh, and, and so he, he let us, this is not that, but we were able to uh, look at all of his research, look at many of the historical artifacts and discuss that with him. And then we had lunch. Uh, they hosted us for a wonderful vegetarian meal. Now, most of what we ate there was not vegetarian. We had to have, there were about 12 of us that were at the vegetarian table and, and everybody else was at the meat table. And there were, there was a lot of meat, <laughs> let me tell you. <laughs> um, but then you'll see some of the meals that we did receive that were uh, all vegetarian and they were quite good. We were then taken to a museum uh, of the Marquis Yi of Zheng, um, where this tomb was unearthed in uh, 433 before Common Era. Uh, and if you look at the upper right, these are, are the actual bells that came, a musical instrument, which came from the tomb. And on the, on the lower left, you'll see the reproduction of the same, a very painstaking, uh, detailed reproduction of the same musical instruments that um, where they've created a performance room and musicians actually play the ancient, um, the ancient instruments and the ancient music. And it was really stunning. There were, uh, there was a, traditional dance performed and, uh, and, and I mean, you can see how well preserved this is. The actual tomb of the marquee is, is on the left, upper left, and then in the right they had, they had a whole room that was dedicated to armor and weaponry that was found inside the, uh, into, inside the tomb. And of course this is for the, uh, for the cavalry, for the horses, and all perfectly preserved. So you know, when you think about it, you know, this stuff is 2,500 years old, nearly that, and uh, extraordinarily well prepared. And you know, I'm a museum guy, so it was fascinating for me to go through all the bits and pieces. And I have a million pictures of all of this stuff. But uh, these are just some of the highlights. And uh, to be able to listen to the cultural display was really valuable and very interesting to me. And uh, they were very kind hosts in, in accommodating and setting all of this up for us to see. I think what's especially fascinating is that you get a glimpse into uh, the, the level of technology they had uh, 24, 2500 years ago. Um, what were they able to make uh, out of the metal? Oh um, yeah, you know what? What were the instruments? What were the implements? Um, you know, and some of it, I'm sure. You know, uh, the tools of war. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, armor, weapons, and so forth. Um, you know, just endless fascination. You know, without without the, the what we are familiar with as the modern industrial base, they were never nevertheless able to make some pretty amazing things. Oh, they absolutely were. And you know, what was fascinating to me is these are all iron bells and each one tuned to a specific pitch, even these huge, I mean, person-sized bells that, um, and there is a, there's a performance style that's very much geared towards this idea of uh, the same principle as the Zen archery where where you align yourself with the chi, with the energy, to be able to generate the performance and the energy of the music so that it's all harmonious and synchronized. But to just think what it would actually take, because I did, I thought about that. If you were uh, a metal smith and to create these shapes in exactly the right shape, form, size, the amount of experimentation that that must have taken, the actual time and effort to create something that huge and distinct with specific tonal qualities, 
I mean, that's an immense job. And uh, in stark contrast, you know, when Bill's presentation we talked about everything with practice and perseverance, when you think about how most of our society we experience today is so impatient to just get to the point and get the reward of whatever it is that we want to get, contrasted to the patience and time that it would have taken to create something like that and about how that was more of the common experience at that time. You know, we've, we've gained some things by being able to move quicker, but I think we've lost quite a few things too because our, our patience is certainly limited. Well, you know, one, one extra dimension uh, for you specifically is the musician side of you. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you, uh, you understand music in a, in a way that I never could. Uh, you are able to, uh, you know, play instruments, you, you compose, you understand music in that way, and you can uh, see through that lens, this ancient expression of creativity mm -hmm. uh, musically. Uh, and the other point that you made is, uh, is also fascinating from a historical perspective. They have, you know, phenomenal craftsmen. They were just one step short of mass production. And therefore, you know, when the Europeans came around that had the, uh, their own uh, phenomenal craftsmanship and mass production, that they were, that one factor allowed them to, to dominate for, for, for decades and centuries. Yeah, yeah. Very, really fascinating, really fascinating. Our next stop along the way was the Yellow Crane Tower. So this was um, a tower, it was a watchtower essentially, that has, is linked to uh, Taoist legend where one of the immortals is said to have flown to heaven and rested on Snake Hill where it resides. And uh, the tower itself on the upper right that you see currently was actually reproduced in 1985 with concrete with modern building uh, materials to uh, represent the tower, which was originally the first incarnation of it, they believe, was built in 223 uh, Common Era. And where it originally was placed, if you'll look on the upper side, you'll see a bridge on the left-hand side. So this is the Yangtze, am I saying that right, the uh, river? Um, so right about where the second pylon was, where you see that bridge going over, it's where the original tower was built. And this is about a kilometer away from it. Um, it was destroyed so many times. <laughs> People lit it on fire, blew it up because it was sort of the safeguard for that city. And so you'll see in the lower portion one of the uh, one of the actual historical paintings of the original. Well, I don't know which original facility, but one of them came from. Uh, I think that painting was from the Ming Dynasty uh, of one of the incarnations of the original tower. So you can actually see where it really was. But uh, the, the wonderful part about this was that when you get up on the top of it, the, brute, the view is breathtaking because you can see the convergence of all of these rivers and the different parts of Wuhan, one of which is uh, the political, one of which is the uh, commercial and business district and the other, which is the museums and cultural. So they're, the city is actually divided into these three components. You can see them very clearly when you get up on top. Um, so, it, and it's fascinating, it's a pagoda with these five levels, and uh, all of them have a lot of very interesting historical in, uh, information inside. And on the top is actually a, a miniature scale of what that, uh, the, what they believe to be the original building structure of multiple buildings when it was down uh, by, the, uh, by the river, what it actually looked like. And they're incredibly detailed and specific and in miniature, so they're very interesting to see. Would it be very cool for you to 
get your yellow jumpsuits and bring oh, them man. and pick up <laughs> all the levels and play Korea with Jabbar. That's right, right <laughs> at the top. Game of death, revisited. The next stop along the way, <clears throat> uh, and I hope I pronounce this right, Tang Chung Guan uh, Dallas Temple. Now, there are a variety of perspectives about this and conflicting data about when it was built because when uh, in the lower right hand side is the abbot of the, uh, of the temple who's explaining to us about the Tao through translators and about that particular temple and he had said it was it was built uh, before at some point before Common Era. But when you actually look at the plaque outside, it says that it was built around 1200, which was during the during the reign of Genghis Khan. And um, it was built by the Yuan Dynasty's patriarch, who is uh, Chu Chengji, I think is how you pronounce that. And uh, for his own practice, and it, it was originally in a pine forest, which was secluded and beautiful, and now it's right smack in the middle of the city. So, uh, you know, they pulled the bus up and, and we all got out, and it's this very interesting Dallas monastery right in the middle of everything. Um, so what you will see are multiple buildings. I think there's 30 some odd buildings. And that's Master Joe and I in front of uh, the main temple. And on the lower left is the altar at the main temple. Um, what you see on the, on the lower portion is the dinner that they had for us. And uh, the upper left is the actual dinner there that they created for us, which was an all-vegetarian uh, meal, of course, being Dallas, and uh, which was really good. And uh, then in the center was another wonderful vegetarian meal, and this was actually a meal that was uh, prepared at Wudong, our first night in uh, Wudong. But if you see the yin yang up on yeah, the soup, yeah, I was like, oh, that is awesome. <laughs> and um, so, but it was just wonderful food, really good. And I, and I have to say, we had the greatest group of people. They're all Master Joe's students, but just the kindest, warmest group that we were so uh, fortunate to be with one another. And we were so. Um, that we were uh, all so very engaged in this process that, um, you know, it, for instance, as we went through some of the uh, temples, just spontaneously the, the group began to chant with the Om mantra. And you want to talk about powerful walking through those steps thousands of years old and hearing this resonant chant as we were moving through that. Uh, some of the priests looked at us and kind of nodded their head like, yeah, they're on the right path. So um, it was just really a, an extraordinary experience. It's a uplifting, elevating migration. It was, absolutely. And so uh, this, this, was the, this is the primary uh, uh, historical temple in Wuhan that we were able to to visit. Then we moved on to Wudong, and Wudong is, is not just one mountain, it's a series of seven mountains, a, a small mountain chain uh, that resides in, in uh, south central China, and uh, of course known as the birthplace of Tai Chi, uh, a, a derivative of the Shaolin, and um, this is actually at the base of Wudang. So um, I had envisioned this being a very rustic setting. And when we arrived at the base of the mountains, the upper left is the view from the lobby of the hotel. So they, there's a lake and you, know, you can see the foothills there at the beginning. 
to the right is Joanne and I staying, uh, standing in front of a very large Yinyang uh, Daiji in, in the front of the hotel. So this is where we practice our Qigong on the first uh, morning. We all separated men on the uh, Yang side and women on the Yin side. And the Yin side and uh, we practice the Daiji or the uh, Qigong facing the uh, mountain. On the right is the inside of the uh, lobby of the hotel. What I had presumed was going to be rustic was quite elegant. It was very nice. Very modern. Yeah, it was, and, and the rooms were beautiful. Um, I do have to say, though, even though there were elevators, it was a massive workout every time because you had to actually walk up three big ramps to just get to the elevators. <laughs> so I was saying, if you, you know, if you were uh, if you were ADA, or if you were you know you were in a wheelchair, you'd be there to have some strong pushers behind you to <laughs> get you up those things. Because man, I, I was huffing and puffing by the time I got up there. And if you're an eight year old martial arts master, you just fly up there. And I got to tell you, now you'll see a little bit later here. It was just filled with steps and ramps and just constant walking. And my 80-year-old teacher smoked us all. He, he would just, boop, 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 there he would go, uh, up just these enormous amount of steps. And um, so I, I very strongly aspired to be at his level of health when I made it because he was uh, remarkable. And what he did every single day, we were out from 7 o'clock in the morning until 8 o'clock every day, constantly seeing things, constantly practicing, constantly doing things. And then he spent, from the time at which we got back until midnight at least, every night healing people. And then got up and just did it all over again. He was with us every step of the way, too. So for him, his energy was boundless. I was really blown away by that. Here's an example of what is possible when yeah. you follow a path to that extent. Yeah, it is. Um, on the left was uh, again, kind of in the flats of Wuhan. And I need to get a little closer to this so I can see that. Yuju Palace was a And I can provide like an impromptu place. So the name so the name of the palace is Yu Shu. So whenever you see X in the mainland China romanization system, it's uh, think just think S H. So S H U. Shu, the second character, means empty. So it does appear in the Tao Te Ching quite a few times. And then Yu, the first character, you'll see that it's uh, it's like, you know, three bars, three horizontal bars, one vertical bar, and then one dot. That is the character for J. Mm -hmm. So if, if it doesn't have that one dot, if it's just the three bars and then the one vertical uh, beam, then that's the character for Wang, which means king. Yeah. So the, 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 the piece of jade that the king wears is, is jade. Mm -hmm. So yu shu, uh, jade, and then emptiness. Of course, the, uh, the, the, the Chinese people would not necessarily think of it as the jade emptiness palace. They just think of it as the name, yu shu. Mm, yeah. And uh, this was, again, one of the, the core temples. And this is a place where they had Tai Chi schools at the base of uh, Wudong. And so that's all of them practicing uh, in that center photo. And it was really uh, quite beautiful. And it was a beautiful day. And to see that, the practice, the practice, the practice. And there were several people there from New Zealand, Australia, excuse me. Uh, people from the West who had enrolled in this Tai Chi school and were going through the process. Now, as we went up Wudong into the mountains <clears throat> later that week, 
because we spent about five days there. We saw the same guys that were down here in the flats, and one of their exercises was to jog the mountain. So, I mean, we're not talking about a short distance here. We're talking about something that takes you a couple to three days to get up. Now, uh, Master Cho told us that he grew up at Wudong at the Purple Heaven Palace. He said, in the old days, it took you two days to get down the mountain to get your supplies, and then two days to get back carrying all the stuff. And it was horses and donkeys. It wasn't, uh, you know, and they were just dirt paths. It had nothing to do with the industrialization that you see now. Uh, but these guys, <laughs> whoever their teacher was, had them jogging up the mountain, which could would be ordinarily about a two-day trek. And let me tell you, when I saw these guys, that that mountain was no joke. It's it's steep, and they were all sweating it out. Um, on the far right is the primary walkway, the pathway to the main temple, and on the right, on either side, you have these enormous frogs, uh, or uh, no, I said take that turtles. Turtles representative of Earth, and um, I, and I mean like seven ton turtles, enormous, inside those uh, temple uh, buildings on the, to the right and to the left. And the left hand side is inside the main complex, uh, and that is, uh, I, I was doing some Qigong there. On the lower center is outside the main temple. But if you look closely, that's Joanne uh, feeling a little bit of tree chi there. So Joanne's up in the tree. She decided to climb the tree and uh, feel the energy of the tree while she was uh, while we were uh, at that place. Uh, the next photo lower right um, is going up the steps to the main temple, and then there's Joanne in the lower right making an offering at the uh, altar at the main, uh, main temple. Now, this is up the mountain. So this is where we stayed. On the upper left-hand side, you can see how beautiful it is. And you can see the picture the photos on the top are actually going up uh, into the into the to the primary summit. And you can see the peaks on the right hand side and you can see the lake in the lower portion or, or on the center the upper center photo. Um, that's us practicing Qigong in the morning uh, on the left. The lower left is um, it's calligraphy um, that says Ti San First Mountain. Um, you know, I imagine Superman practices calligraphy and that's how it got there. Yeah, it must have been because <laughs> this is huge. You know, you know, whoever painted this thing, the, the symbols are, this is a massive cliff on the top of which is if you look on the middle photo on the right hand side, the Golden Palace. And, and, and this is a huge mountain. If you look on the lower portion, this is the cable car. So where we're standing during the Qigong basically is the bottom of where this cable car resides. You take the, table, the cable car up to where that middle on the right is, where you see the city and the clouds, basically. And that's where you get off the cable car. So prior to the cable car being there, you have to walk up that mountain. From the point at which you get off the cable car, there are 17,000 steps to be able to get to the top. And so you see it's circuitous. It, it goes around. What they've said is it's the turtle and the snake on the turtle's back, representative of heaven and earth. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the center photo with Joanne on the steps is actually a Wushu school that's right at the base of where the cable cars, where you get on them, 
and uh, that's where our hotel was, was right there. But can you imagine practicing the uh, Tai Chi, the Wushu, in that setting every day? Oh, man. Um, so on the uh, upper right-hand side, now 17,000 steps. That's a lot of steps going up. Yeah. And uh, let me tell you, <laughs> there were probably 85-year-old women right next to me yanking little three-year-old kids. And we're talking about probably 12 to 16-inch steps, right? Mm -hmm. And they were just trucking right up these steps. No problem. And dragging these kids <laughs> right alongside them. So grandma was yanking the little kid right up the steps. I mean, we're talking about no ABA ha access here. We're just mm -hmm. talking about, you know, get up there as best you can. Uh, so I think that sort of speaks to the level of health as in comparison to, you know, where I'm from in Kentucky, if you took a lot of elderly people and you tried to pull them up those steps, you'd have heart attacks 300 a day. Left to right. Yeah. Uh, and I'm also imagining that in the higher altitudes, the air is a lot thinner. It is. So uh, you don't just need very good, you know, cardio. Uh, help to be able to, to do that. You also have to uh, be acclimated to the high altitudes. Yeah, yeah. But uh, this was fascinating. <clears throat> now, this is actually going up. So on the uh, left-hand side is me sweating it out as I was going up all those steps. And uh, this is actually, the center two photos was actually a different temple that we went to right after this. Uh, but I had to put our obligatory uh, Kung Fu shots in there in our bow. So the uh, the um, upper right is the view uh, from the top, or and the lower uh, the lower right is also the view from the top of the temple, looking down into the mountains. And where we're standing in front is actually the front of the the very top, which is the Golden Palace. And this was all made of bronze and gold. And there's something like 30 tons of bronze and I forget how many pounds of gold that this is actually made out of. And if you think about what would it take to actually build this city at that time period in the 1400s, to be able to actually, so they, they began the building complexes in the Tang Dynasty in the 600s. And this continued through the Ming Dynasty. And so you think about building this building, what it took, the amount of people, the labor, to be able to create this at the very tip of the highest mountain. I mean, that is just carrying the material there. And the logistics of that alone. And you're not talking about a cable car. No. You're talking about mules and people mm -hmm. being able to take all that stuff up to the top of that mountain. That is a staggering task. Now this is the Purple Heaven Palace. Uh, and this is one of the root of roots of the Dragon Gate lineage of uh, Qigong. And uh, this was this was built in the 1100s. This is where Master Cho basically grew up. His uncle was a Taoist priest at this monastery, and we were able to go back. If you look in the lower left-hand side, he taught us on the same stones where he learned as a child, and for literally hundreds of years people had practiced before us doing the same thing. So um, as he taught us, there were other people, tourists, that were sort of milling about. So the following day, when we went to the White Cloud Monastery, it was just us. And he actually completed the Qigong set, which was the five element Qigong, and he, and he, he, would, he didn't want to give it in front of just strangers. So he was holding it and holding out, basically, for us. But this is where we were able to practice. And the lower white is actually the steps leading up to the main temple. 
And again, these are all building complexes that as you go into the main gate, then there are mul multiple buildings that basically lead up the mountain with all of these you know, in higher and higher levels. And then the left-hand side is the, is the uh, main altar. But a lot of these had multiple altars to multiple deities and, um, uh, you know, so there, there's a lot to see in these places. And many of these have been burned down, rebuilt, burned down, rebuilt, burned down, and rebuilt. In fact, one of these that we saw a little bit later uh, had been around since, I think, the 400s. And one of the students at the Wushu School, whoopsie, dropped a, uh, dropped a match and basically burned the whole thing down. <laughs> Could you imagine being that guy? <laughs> oh. I don't know where he ended up, but I'm sure it wasn't good wherever it was. Yeah. And he's with the three students. Yeah. <laughs> now, this is back down at the base of the mountain, <clears throat> and uh, the gentleman on the upper left is the president of the Wudong uh, Martial Arts Association, and he presented Master Zhou with, as you see, the statue on the uh, upper right. Uh, the statue and the representation between the United States and China you know, showing cooperation of spirit and Master Zhou's award for spreading the teachings of Wudong to the West. Um, and the, the uh, Tai Chi theater is right in the center. So this is not some little tiny many place. This is an enormous complex. Yeah, it is. And so this is uh, Joanne and I outside the door and then they gave a performance uh, of the Wudong Wushu and those are the guys who did it. We had dinner with them on the left. And it was the best Wushu show that I've ever seen. I mean, it was unbelievable, the production value with the lights, the music, the story, it followed the story of kind of a love story, and, uh, but the acrobatics, the theme, the energy of it, it was, I mean, I've seen, I've seen the traveling Shaolin show, I've seen a lot of these types of things, and it blew me away. It was really, really good, and all these guys were very nice that we uh, were able to hang out and have dinner with them. They're young guys. They're all probably in their teens and 20s. Perhaps if you bring the show into the United States, that could be uh, quite a nice... Well, we we were talking about that. I mean, they really want us to be a conduit. Uh, part of what was said at the meeting, there was an internal meeting where, um, it's, <laughs> it's not on here, but where Master Joe asked, uh, Joanne and I do attend along with several other people and where they kind of charged us with the duty of passing on the Wudong teachings in the United States and uh, you know I vowed that I would do that in the best way that I could. We did speak with uh, the abbot of the Dallas Temple in Wuhan and with the president of the association here about creating some sort of uh, way in which we could bring them over and uh, you know we could go back so it's the beginning of a, a really a, what I feel is going to be a wonderful relationship. After our time in at Wudong which again was great it was five days of the trip so it, I, and I could have stayed there the whole time it was uh, to me the best part of it. Uh, and I would have been perfectly content for you to just leave me alone at one of those monasteries. And uh, you know, if I had, if I was able to, I got to learn the language. That's the key. <laughs> um, but uh, I would have been very happy to do that. Then we went back to Beijing, and uh, the upper left is the White Cloud Monastery again, one of the Dragon Gate um, home bases. And the, the gentleman who's talking to us there is one of their doctors, uh, the acupuncturists. And if you'll notice in his right hand, he's got a weapon. 
uh, he gave us this wonderful uh, flexible weapon demonstration uh, because that's the, the martial arts is part of their physical training to stay in shape. And uh, he was telling all of us about the re regenerative properties of the acupuncture, but more importantly on the spiritual level, how the spirit elevates and becomes one with the Tao. Uh, that's the altar at the, uh, at the temple. That's the primary entrance on the left-hand side. And then on the uh, right-hand side is the, the emperor's summer palace. We went to uh, <clears throat> we went to visit that. This lake that you see Joanne and I standing in front of and on the left-hand side is entirely man-made. And this was entirely man-made at a time when there were no there was no automation. I they told us the statistics, but there were literally I think a million people called in to do this. The hill that you see the palace built on is the dirt that they excavated from the lake and built it all up so that they could put the palace on a hill. All that was flat land. Mm. So think about the amount of work that it actually took, the manpower to create mm. a lake of that size and then to make literally a mountain that you would build the palace on. Yeah, the uh, scale of it was staggering. And I don't think they paid too well. <laughs> <laughs> what? No minimum wage? Emperor said, uh, you're going to do it. And that was the <laughs> job, and that was it. Then we went to the Great Wall, uh, Forbidden City in Tiananmen Square. So, uh, in the center of the lower portion, you see Dallas, who's one of our friends there that went with us. And uh, then our, uh, our guide, whose name I believe is Peter, and, uh, or that's the name he you know, took for himself anyway. And um, the funny part about that is, you know, we all had a joke of he would, he would always say, okay, come on, come on, come on, get on the bus, get on the bus. Because, he, because when we saw the groups of Chinese tourists, they move so quickly through these places. They go to see four major locations in the morning and then four in the afternoon every day at these tours. And apparently October is the big tourist month in uh, China. So Peter kind of short-circuited when after the first day of this rush, 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 because you couldn't really adequately see anything. You know, when you went to these places and you went in, you, you really want to take the time to absorb it and be with it. And so we could have taken a full day at any of these places just to, I mean, even that wouldn't have really done it justice. Mm -hmm. So Peter had a real, <laughs> he was so used to that method of touring <laughs> that we, we finally kind of revolted and said, hey, you know what? If we don't get to that other stuff in the afternoon, we're good with that. <laughs> Why don't you give us an overview and then just let us go and give us a time to come back and then we'll, we'll eventually, we'll make it back here and then we can go do our next thing. And it was almost as though he was, remember, um, you remember the inspector in the Pink Panther movies? Oh, yeah. Clouseau, oh, yeah. who had the nervous twitch because uh, <laughs> Clouseau would drive him crazy. Well, that's kind of what he was doing to us because it's so short-circuited his brain that we did not want to go to all these places and hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. We just wanted to just kind of split and do our own thing. Uh, I think the American perspective kind of short-circuited his brain all of you, you Westerners? That's right. What your strange preference to be in the moment? Yeah. I cannot understand you. So uh, the wall was wonderful. I'm not going to... I didn't want to bore you with a bunch of photos of that because everybody's seen it overdone to the nth degree. But it's staggering and amazing to actually stand on it and be able to walk and see, again, the enormity of the project. Um, the best part of the wall, to me, on the lower right-hand side, see that slide? Well, we couldn't on that day because it was raining a little bit and you go too fast. 
what they do is they let you, you there's a chairlift to get you up to it. And this is the longest slide I've <laughs> ever seen in my life. It goes in this circuitous route all the way down the mountain. And you can get in what's basically the equivalent of a burlap sap and just cruise all the way down on this slide. Yeah. But they wouldn't let, it, let us do it because when it gets slick, apparently people, it goes so fast that you slide out and go shooting off into the, into the bushes. <laughs> uh, but uh, I was so bummed about that. We were all really bummed because we were looking forward to being able to hit that slide. But anyway, the wall, of course, historically was fascinating and enormous. But, uh, and then, of course, being in Tiananmen Square, uh, the hub of the government, that's the whole group in the lower left-hand side, and that's moving into the Forbidden City. And you can see the amount of people there. It was so crammed. It was like a sea of people trying to get to any of the main buildings. If you went into it, you felt like you were in the waves because you just got pushed around, and that's pretty much how it was. Again, fascinating, but you can put me at Wudong in the mountains, and I would have been a happy guy. And then last, we went to Shanghai, uh, which is an extraordinarily modern city, uh, contrasted with the ancient. So you can see uh, the shopping in the center, and then the second tallest building in the world, uh, next to the one in Dubai, which is in the upper left. Um, then in the right, contrasted by the, these beautiful gardens that we went to visit. Uh, which are the remaining slides. And again, we just had a beautiful, wonderful time going through this entire process. And again, it came back to, and the beauty of this was to be, have the opportunity to be guided by someone who was being honored by the Chinese government for his contribution to the philosophy and the art uh, and the history of China so that we were able to be a part of that. And the, the wonderful part is that it was all based in the Tao. And we went to see so many temples and that there was a connection to it where he grew up and the teachings that he gives us and how that correlates to everything that we do here. So. Uh, I hope that was interesting to everybody, and uh, yeah, we had a great time. And you know, to me, this is just kind of a uh, a warm up for things to come. And uh, I, I think you know, Master Joe wants us to go back and forth with him and uh, continue to do this and expose more people to it. It looks like a triple life. It was really great, really good. I'm, I'm so glad we did. Amazing, amazing sights. Let's just go ahead and do the meeting ending ritual, everybody. Join the Dao Meeting Live to participate in the questions and commentary. For more information, go to http colon forward slash forward slash taoism.net forward slash tao forward slash connect dash online.